Okay, I think we're gonna get started now. Um, so, welcome to all of our attendees and to our esteemed panelists. My name is Amanda Richardson. I'm the Executive Director of the Corporation for New Jersey Local Media, which is the host of this webinar on analyzing the state budget. Our mission is to build strong communities through journalism and civic engagement. Today's webinar on New Jersey's new budget is part of our community engagement series. Forums like these that promote civic engagement are a vital part of our mission. You can see our past webinars on the future of local journalism and on the effects of COVID on the future of New Jersey Transit Rail on our website, which is newsweneed.org. Uh, you can also sign up to be notified when registration opens for our upcoming webinars. Those are on the boom in suburban real estate, bus transit issues, watershed protection, and education challenges in the midst of the coronavirus. So before we start, just a few housekeeping items. If you have a question for the panelists, please put it in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. And if you're having a technical issue, please try to use the chat to flag it, which is over on the side. Um, we're also recording this webinar and we'll make it available on our website within the week. And it's also being carried live right now on Facebook by both us and our media sponsor, the New Jersey Hills Media Group. The New Jersey Hills Media Group operates 14 weekly newspapers in print and online in Morris, Somerset, Essex, and Hennepin counties. And it's one of the few news organizations in New Jersey that still covers dozens of local government meetings each month and provides traditional in-depth community journalism. We'd like to thank them for their sponsorship and encourage you to go subscribe at NewJerseyHills.com. So turning to today's topic, New Jersey passed its 2021 state budget a few weeks ago. The budget includes a number of controversial provisions, including borrowing $4.5 billion to balance the budget, raising the millionaire's tax and corporation business tax, and introducing a CHAV rebate program. We're very pleased to have four of the state's top fiscal policy experts here with us today to discuss the budget. Going alphabetically, we have Richard Keevey, who served as the budget director for two New Jersey governors, one Republican and one Democrat, and went on to Washington to serve as Deputy Undersecretary of the Defense Department and CFO of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. He's a senior policy fellow at Rutgers and a lecturer at Princeton University. Next, we have Brandon McCoy, who is president of New Jersey Policy Perspective, an influential liberal think tank for the past 30 years. When the Murphy administration convened the state's various advocacy groups to brief them on the ins and outs of the budget that was adopted last month, it was Brandon who conducted that briefing. Next, we have Senator Steve Oroho, who serves as the Senate Republican Budget Office Officer and is regarded as one of the legislature's leading fiscal policy experts. He's a certified financial planner and he co-chaired the bipartisan economic and fiscal policy work group that produced the Path to Progress report. And then finally, we have John Reitmeyer, who is the budget and fiscal policy reporter for New Jersey Spotlight, which is the new nonprofit public policy website that merged with New Jersey Network News last year and continues to provide in-depth analysis of the most complex public policy issues. You can find his work at njspotlight.com. So to dive into the questions, uh, my first question is, did New Jersey really need to borrow $4.5 billion to balance this year's budget? Was that the right decision? And were there other alternatives? So Professor, I'd like to start with you on this one. You need to unmute yourself, sorry. <laughs> there we go, thanks Amanda. As soon as I figure out Zoom, I'll give you my answer, all right? I think it was a very bad decision. It wasn't needed. It's going to be very costly. It's a one-time slug of money into the budget that can't be repeated. And the use of the money, for example, homestead rebates, was poorly designed. So from an overall point of view of using bond money for operating purpose, I think it was poor and not needed. So. All right, Rich, so if it's not needed, what other options do you have? Well, there's a whole bunch of options out there, any one of which or a combination of which would have addressed the problem. First, we could have made some reductions. A simple 2% reduction would have gained about a billion dollars. Instead, the governor, as well as the legislature, added money into the budget. The budget is as big as what it was proposed back in February. Two, we could have reduce perhaps the contribution to the pension system. We have $4.8 billion in there. We could have deferred a billion perhaps. We could catch up with later. Other people would say, well, the pension's already underfunded. That's correct. But it would be a better option in my opinion than borrowing money. 
Third, we could increase some taxes and use them, in my opinion, properly. If we increase the income tax, I have no problem with that, but we shouldn't be giving homestead rebates for it. We could increase the sales tax, bring it back to where it was before it was reduced about two years ago, bring it back to 7% would generate $700 million. Same thing could be said for the inheritance tax. We don't need to reinstate the whole amount, but we could raise the limit and tax and gain some money that way. We could look at the tax expenditures. There are $30.5 billion of tax deferrals, credits and deductions in the tax code. They don't look, be looked, they don't be reviewed every year. They should be. There's some in there that probably just aren't necessary anymore. We could look, we should have looked at taxing our residents who used to work in New York City, now work from home. They shouldn't be paying taxes anymore to New York. We should be paying them to New Jersey. We should have looked at that. And we certainly for, should look at it in the future. And finally, I think the estimates for the income, for the taxes in general have been understated. I don't know whether they were deliberately understated or perhaps they didn't use the best up-to-date estimates, uh, but any combination of them would have uh, eliminated the need to borrow very bad practice. One comment before I end. I was a budget director under Governor Florio and Kane. Both of them faced fiscal problems in a proportional basis bigger than this problem. And what we did was cut spending and increase taxes, both Governors Kane and Florio. And the problem proportionately, because they had a much smaller budget, was much bigger than this problem. So a bad decision, in my opinion. Well, thank you. Well, you certainly aren't on the fence about this. Um, Brandon, what do you think? Was it, was it necessary to borrow the money? Well, I think borrowing was uh, a decision that was made for a couple of reasons that should be very deeply and uh, carefully understood. One is that the state did not have a sufficient rainy day fund. Uh, for the past decade, after the rainy day fund was exhausted under the Great Recession, uh, the state did not reinvest in it significantly. And actually the first investment made back into the rainy day fund was our previous budget, which was approximately $400 million, which doesn't even operate the state for more than, you know, more than two days, honestly. And when the crisis first hit, a lot of state policy and budget experts were saying, hey, states, you know, tap your rainy day funds now. We didn't have that luxury because we did not make rainy day fund investments a priority for the previous decade. And actually, John Reitmeyer has a great article that he produced, uh, I believe, sometime in June highlighting this fact. And so uh, we put ourselves in a bit of a bind by not doing that for the past decade. And then also, when you look at federal support, because we do not operate in a vacuum, uh, you know, what the state has the opportunities to do also oftentimes depends on what the federal government is doing. Uh, when we went through the Great Recession, the Obama administration directed over $17 billion in effect to the state of New Jersey. So far under this crisis, while there's been a lot of money received from the federal government for things like unemployment insurance and other cash supports to residents who are hurt, hurting uh, significantly right now, uh, we did not receive nearly as much flexible funds from the federal government. And so I think it's a little bit jumping the gun to say that the crisis, that we have a good sense of what the crisis is and, with, and the size of it, we are still in the middle of this crisis. We are about to go into the winter months without a verified vaccine. People are gonna be inside and closer indoors. We will likely have higher viral spread and we are nowhere near you know, the end of this problem, of this challenge. And so I think the borrowing was pursued to give us flexibility uh, to address challenges that we don't foresee necessarily, but we know are likely gonna be great. Now the $4.5 billion figure, uh, I think you can argue over that. And it was originally supposed to be $4 billion and then it was supposed to be $4 billion over the course of a 10 year payment plan. And then that very, very quickly became 4.5 billion over the course of a 12 year payment plan. That's not something that you like to see, uh, you know, happen so swiftly when you've just borrowed more money. Um, but I, I, I agree with the professor that raising taxes would have been far more preferable uh, if we could have done that. And there's plenty to do with regards to the estate tax and the inheritance tax, as he mentioned, uh, restoring the sales tax to where it was. And the NJ policy perspective, my organization actually put out a plan that would have raised over $3 billion 
the majority, vast majority of which would, would have been focused on the top 1% of households. And so there were different options available to us, but I think in just the sausage making process, you end up having a situation where we end up deciding to borrow. And I don't think borrowing is the worst idea in the world, depending on how you do it. But there are some concerns that we're going to make, make mistakes that we don't need to make. Thanks, Brandon. So, Senator, do you do you agree with with the suggestion that maybe taxes should have been raised and there were different taxes to look at? Do you think that the the borrowing was necessary? Oh, uh, first of all, I don't think any taxes needed to be raised. Um, I also don't think the borrowing was was uh, necessary. Uh, and as the, as um, uh, Mr. Keeley uh, had mentioned, that I, I I do think it was. A very, it's, it's very irresponsible, uh, when, and particularly when you look at New Jersey's total uh, financial, you know, position. Well, first of all, you know, as as the Murphy administration had talked about for a long time, the issue had been ten billion. And when he was down with uh, President uh, Trump at the time, he, he mentioned it could be twenty to thirty billion. And when we asked, he said, "How, you know, where did that number come from?" The administration even said, "We don't know." Uh, but in any any event, we they ended up. Um, looking for authority to borrow 10 billion when the uh, 9.9 .9 billion to be exact. And then when the, um, uh, the budget came in, it was submitted at the 4 billion. But as, as the professor had talked about, there were so many different other options. We didn't have to be in that kind of, you know, in that kind of situation. Certain steps could be made to, to help, you know, uh, save money, um, you know, right away. For example, the furlough program that was on a bipartisan basis recommended wasn't put in place until basically it was it was way too late, and you know and essentially money that would have been paid by the federal government was uh, wasn't taken advantage of. The other thing is is uh, uh, is the path to progress you had mentioned earlier. There's a number of recommendations in there that would help put us on a better fiscal footing going you know going forward. Uh, I think we should have looked at that. And Professor Kevian mentioned. The New York, New Jersey issue, and that's not a small issue. It's probably at least a billion, probably more now, more than a billion dollars. And we're not talking about New Jersey residents paying more tax. We're actually talking to them about paying less tax. They pay more to New York uh, than they would to New Jersey. And let's remember that money goes into the property tax relief fund, which is primarily used you know, for education. But most people would end up paying less tax. And and I'm reminded of the uh, the comment that Governor Cuomo said when the uh, healthcare workers were going into New York, let's remember when you're coming in here, you're going to be paying New York taxes. Um, so if New Jersey was, was more aggressive, we, New Jersey, unfortunately, just did not address this one, you one bit. We'll keep pressing for it because as, as the uh, professor mentioned, this, is, this, this pandemic has shown that we're going to work differently. And the way it goes is if you're in New Jersey and you're working from New Jersey, that is legitimately New Jersey income tax and the people would pay less, less total tax. The other, the other things is um, if we had allowed the administration, and I, I, I worked with Senator Sarlo, Senator Singleton, and Senator Ruiz on that fiscal strategies committee. And we had lots and lots of um, meetings with, with businesses to help demonstrate to the administration that they had plans to open up safely. And I want to, I really want to emphasize safely, which would have helped our revenue numbers um, even, you know, uh, be, uh, you know, better than what they actually came in with. And they came in significantly higher than what had been, what had been expected. But if you take a look at what we did with daycare and with the summer camps, and then even with the restaurants opening now, you haven't seen, and the governor has mentioned that they haven't seen the spike with respect to the opening up of the 25% for in, indoor dining. Um, but if we had opened up, you know, safely sooner, the, the whole would have is essentially been a heck of a lot, uh, a lot less. The other thing I'll bring up is, and the professor brought up, is there was no negotiations other than, the, other than to make sure that the uh, step increases were in. The only, the only negotiation that happened was a deferral of a cost of living adjustment for a few months where I, quite frankly, I think we should have had some sort of discussion with, with the unions to say, hey, you know, not that we would cut it, just say, what if we put in the same 70%, which actually would have had a larger pension payment than last year, uh, but unfortunately that wasn't uh, accepted. It, it wasn't even tried. 
And I'm, I'm not sure what the, what the position would be, but I think we should have at least, uh, you know, tried that. And the last I'll, I'll, I'll end with the utilization of the CARES Act money uh, directly to the state, to the state this is. Now, this does not include what goes to the municipalities, the counties, the colleges, the schools, the unemployment that Brandon had, had mentioned about, which, you know, billions and billions of dollars from the federal government. The other thing that the administration hasn't used is, is really there's, there was $5 billion that came in, $4.9 billion that some went directly to the departments, but $2.4 billion of that came in directly to the state. Uh, I know the governor has said that you really, not a lot of flexibility, but if you look at the treasury, you know, uh, frequently asked questions on that, there was quite a bit of flexibility and it certainly could have been used to help our businesses uh, open up safely and, and uh, help generate additional uh, tax revenue it would have made the whole a heck of a lot, a heck of a lot less than what it is. And I'll end that. So I don't think it was necessary at all. Okay, thanks so much. Um, and John, the same question. Also, I'd love to hear, uh, this is a lot to ask of you, but your responses to some of these um, assertions and suggestions that have been made, especially uh, what Brandon was saying about the rainy day fund. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. And so in my role, you know, covering this is still a developing budget and the borrowing actually hasn't occurred yet. It's, it's teed up, uh, but it, it's not finalized yet. So I'm going to refrain from any, you know, direct opinions on any of this stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, New Jersey was one of the states for sure, as Brandon mentioned, that came into this pandemic triggered recession with very limited reserves as a percentage of total spending. And so uh, New Jersey is kind of middle of the road when it comes to volatility, but we did not hedge that volatility very well headed into this recession. And so, whereas other states had ample reserves on hand to offset some of the losses, New Jersey blew through its reserves rather quickly and actually had to put about a billion dollars in spending into reserve earlier this year. So that's appropriated spending that had to be pulled back and, you know, Professor Keevy mentioned homestead rebates. That was one of the programs that got pinched and that, you know, tax relief that goes to some of the state's lowest income residents, you know, senior citizens and disabled re residents. So there was real impact there. Uh, in just in terms of the borrowing for context, four and a half billion, a little more than 10% of overall yearly spending. So that's a pretty big number. At one point, I think Pew had done some research suggesting the state could appropriately borrow with a uh, reasonable repayment plan with around half of that amount. And so definitely notable that that number got bumped up and uh, is, is, you know, New Jersey, we're likely to benefit because the Federal Reserve continues to have a lending program open that is sort of setting a, a, a floor for the type of interest rate we'll get. But um, I would want to mention you know, it'll all come down to sort of the term and, 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 and what our borrowing costs are. 12 years repayment, uh, even at, you know, I think Treasury is looking at a rate somewhere between 2 and 6%. You know, 10, 12 year uh, repayment, you're, you're adding some real costs there. And I think it's a good question to ask what could the state have done without borrowing uh, what could the state do with that money over the next 10 or 12 years if it wasn't having to pay back these debt service costs? At the same time, you know, having covered the Great Recession and the cuts that occurred uh, during the last year of Governor Corzine's tenure and the first year of Governor Christie's, you know, we had significant cuts, uh, education funding. I mean, you know, I think many, many departments were impacted. And the flip side of those cuts is how did they affect services, uh, education spending, property tax relief, things that people really rely on. So I think in order to have a thoughtful conversation about the borrowing, you do have to consider you know, the impacts of what uh, cuts would have to occur if this money wasn't borrowed. The, the last thing I will say, sort of balancing this all out, is we've yet to hear from the rating agencies uh, in terms of what this is going to do to our credit rating. And that's another cost. You know, when our credit rating drops, uh, I think my cat is visiting us here. Uh, when that credit rating drops, it adds to the borrowing costs and they ultimately get pushed along to taxpayers. And so it's all part of the analysis here that I think is, is um, 
worthy of talking about, you know, the size of the borrowing, how much and we end up borrowing, what the costs end up being in terms of what, what taxpayers are going to have to pay, how that affects our credit rating going forward. You know, the state has a lot of debt already on its books, is already one of the nation's most indebted states. But a lot of that debt is for things like schools and roads that a lot of people would support. And then, you know, if we did do some of these drastic cuts, what would the impact of those cuts be? And, and how would that play uh, in our broader economy? This governor in office now, Governor Murphy, he clearly uh, wants to, to spend his way out of this recession. And, and I guess we'll have to see the long-term impact of that. Thanks, John. Um, and I definitely in a little bit want to get back to some of those long-term impacts and what you all think about them. But uh, just to talk a little bit more about specific budget provisions, um, I'm wondering what you all think the impact of raising the corporation business tax and the millionaire's tax is, and if those were the right taxes to raise. So, Senator, let's start with you. Thank you very much, Amanda. And I got to tell you, John, if that cat starts playing that guitar, you can make a lot of money, you know? Um, just, just real quick on the, the taxes, as, as I said before, I don't think we really need to, to raise uh, any, of the, any of the taxes. Um, and New Jersey has been in an uncompetitive position for a long time. And just look at the situation we're in right now, and the unfunded liabilities that we have. And, and the one thing about Trenton is there's a lot of promises that get made, but payments, payments are, you know, promises are easy, payments are tough, right? So if, and I know we've talked about the rainy day funds and the surpluses and stuff. New Jersey doesn't have a surplus. New Jersey has $260 billion worth of, of unfunded liabilities and debt. And that's the situation we're in. So we, you know, that's, that's the honest thing we got, you know, we have to take a look at. So um, the one thing that New, Jer New Jersey has got some great assets. Obviously we got, you know, a great, you know, uh, location. We've got great workforce. We've got a great, education system. We may argue about how it gets funded or where it gets funded. Uh, but let's face it, we have a great education system. We lease for a great workforce. And New Jersey has been very good at, at creating, um, you know, wealth for people. But, the, but one of our biggest exports is the wealth. And if you take a look at the last time we raised, you know, the, the quote unquote millionaire's tax, I guess we went down to 500,000 at the time uh, in 2004. There hasn't been one year, not one year, when New Jersey has brought in more taxable income than what it lost. And if you just take a cumulatively, we're up to about $40 billion worth of net taxable income. Because people come and go, we, we recognize that. If we were just neutral, just neutral, our economic situation would be significantly different and we would have significantly more money in order to utilize for or, you know, our, our, our social, you know, programs, our schools, our, you know, our debt repayments. So that's the thing that I really take a look at. And I, I do, you know, I've been in the financial field for a, a long time. Um, and those capital decisions are extremely, extremely serious. And if you're attractive to capital, which we have not been, you know, obviously by the IRS data, uh, you generally are, are doing very well in your resources and your resources are more. But uh, so I, I, I think we, it was is wrong. It's, it's been, in my, in my uh, opinion, it, it goes back to look at what's happened in the past when we've done these things, we've actually lost, we've actually lost money. It may look like we're bringing in a little bit more money, but over time, we've actually lost, we've actually lost money. And it's not my data, it's the IRS data. And that, that'll show you up through 2018, We've already lost over about 35 billion. So on the current rate, up to today, with the, with, if we were able to see the latest data today, it's 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 certainly got to be 40 billion dollars. And that and if we had and if we just had a, a net zero on that, as I said, our financial position would be a lot different. Thanks, Senator. So, um, Brenda, do you agree with that? Do you or do you have a different take? So I, I think that you know, with regards to the specific question about which you know, the taxes that were raised, were they, were they the right ones? Uh, yes, because, you know, we've, we've been in a situation in this, in this country, and honestly, uh, the, the majority of the last 10 years of the state, where we had tax policy that was tailored towards the already very wealthy, you know, we got rid of the estate tax. We let the millionaire's tax sunset. Uh, we've done a really, really aggressive corporate tax subsidy program that 
puts us way out of whack with the rest of the country. Um, and we've had tax policy that really has focused on putting more money in the pockets of the already wealthy and not so much focused on investing in our assets and programs that really help our, you know, grow our economy and are the, are the building blocks of a robust economy. When you look at the state budget overall, uh, our state budget is still, you know, with regards to, uh, you know, state revenue sources and appropriations is still smaller than it was just before the Great Recession. It's still smaller than it was a decade ago. And I don't know anyone who would consider that a success to, sp to be spending the same amount, and this is, a, this is adjusted for inflation, spending the same amount on your investments and your programs and your services as you were a decade ago. Uh, you know, we have greater challenges that we have learned about over the past decade. We know that climate change and a lot of things are gonna be bringing uh, significant problems to our door as a coastal state. And to have a, a budget that we refuse to grow in a significant way uh, is not giving us the wherewithal to, to marshal the resources to handle those challenges. Um, I would disagree with you know, the point about the IRS data. If it's, if it's the IRS data that I think the Senator is referring to, the IRS actually advises against using that data to make determinations about migration. Um, you know, when you look at state uh, tax, you know, treasury data, it shows that uh, for wealthy tax filers uh, since 1994, we've had a six-fold increase. Uh, actually, more than that, because the, the graph I'm looking at ends in 2015. The only time that we've seen, you know, you know, wealthy tax filers decrease is during recessions. But, you know, when you look at sort of the states that did well coming out of the Great Recession, uh, Minnesota, Massachusetts, California, et cetera, what they did early on was raise revenue. Uh, that put them in a position to stave off, you know, really, really dangerous cuts. And I think it's important to recognize here that, you know, people talk about, you know, making cuts or reducing pension payments, but we need to, rec you know, I think really recognize and be honest with ourselves that austerity, by and large, consistently harms the folks who are least able to handle those harms. It harms uh, poor families, low-income families, low-income workers, and it harms communities of color the most. And I think there's a little bit too much cavalierness with regards to cuts uh, from, from government budgets, especially for a state that we still hadn't really fully recovered from the Great Recession. You look at uh, the, 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 the budget for the Department of Health, it is severely lower than it was you know, prior to 2008. You look at the Department of Labor, same story. How can we expect our state to respond to this crisis in a reasonable and desirable fashion when we refuse to invest in it? Uh, it's not a surprise that people have challenges getting their unemployment applications filed in a you know, reasonable amount of time when the Department of Labor doesn't have the budget to hire the staff to do that, right? So I think just, you know, in general, if we're going to have, you know, this goal of addressing the, the drastic challenges that face us, that means having a tax code and a tax policy that enables that. And, uh, you know, the millionaire's tax is just the first step towards that, but we still have a tax code that, you know, requires more of the middle class than it does of the very, very wealthy. And I don't think that's where we really need to be as a state. Thanks. Um, so there seems to be a bit of a fundamental disagreement here about the effect of taxes on migration. So, John, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and then also on what your thoughts are on the taxes that were raised. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the discussion, um, we, we focus on anecdotes, but there's also good data out there. And I think it, it, it's, it's a really compelling discussion because it, as we see the number of filers in that top bracket, go up. I think I've also seen compelling data comparing us to other states and increases that most other states have experienced. And then you have to, you know, what is New Jersey doing? What's the rate of growth in New Jersey versus other states? Uh, and are we growing our own millionaires for everyone that might leave because they no longer want to, you know, contribute uh, taxes to our state and fund things like education? Uh, are the, are we uh, creating an environment where people can graduate into those upper brackets? And I think uh, that should always be part of this, the discussion. When we, when we look at the two tax sources specifically that went up, um, there was another one, uh, healthcare um, tax that is, is more modest. Um, you know, I think we should also talk about the structure of the budget. You know, um, tax sources themselves in some cases are dedicated to specific purposes. And so when we talk about the income tax, that millionaire's tax increase, that brings in revenue that's dedicated to property tax relief, which can be a lot of different things, but it's not everything. And so there are some constraints 
when we rely heavily on uh, an, a single source of income, especially one that's pretty volatile, as we've learned over the years. Uh, and so I think that also has to be part of the discussion. Uh, the corporate business tax, you know, that is a general fund, fund revenue source. So it brings in money that can be used with uh, fewer uh, constraints, but also has impact on businesses. Now, in, in this case, I think politically, the decision was to enact tax hikes that drew, brought in the most revenue for the least amount of pain on the most amount of people. And what I mean by that is millionaires who are still filing returns that show they have over a million in income, uh, I think the idea is that those people can absorb this hit the most versus if we were to have tax hikes more broadly. Even that sales tax, Professor Keevy mentioned, uh, it is a regressive tax that uh, there are a lot of exclusions, but it does hit uh, people disproportionately. Uh, and then, um, you know, the, the corporate business tax is on the top earning businesses as well. Uh, it, it's probably a harder argument politically because businesses are getting battered all, all over the place. But uh, the idea, I think, politically was to, to, to bring in revenue from those who, uh, at least on, on their tax returns, seem to be best positioned. The one thing I always look at, and I never uh, get very satisfactory answers, is where, where we land from a policy uh, perspective, meaning why 10.75% for the millionaire's tax? What does that do to us um, sort of regionally, nationally? What was the uh, thought behind calibrating the rate at that amount? And usually the argument that I, the response that I get to questions like that is it's more driven by the amount of money that we needed to, to satisfy spending ambitions versus any sort of analysis on the policy side of where we wanna be positioned. And I, I think that's always something that we should be thinking about. Certainly there are realities both politically and fiscally. And you know, the, uh, lawmakers and governors wanna spend money on programs that are their favorites. But at the end of the day, the, the thought process should also see uh, when we make some of these decisions, how, you know, a little bit of a projection on how they could impact the state, you know, both regionally and nationally. Thanks, John. And now, Professor, I saw you went and got a book, so I'm very interested in what you're about to say. I was pulling out the Divine Comedy to see where uh, where, where, <laughs> we, where we sat here. I, I have some, just some quick comments. And it's going back to how I made my comments about the um, issuing of bonds, I suggested in my scenario that it would be proper, in my opinion, to raise some taxes. But what really bothered me is we raised the income tax, which I personally had no problem with the, the, the folks who were gonna to have to pay it. But what is amazing is how we're gonna use it. Did we use it to fix anything that we had a problem in the budget? No. Are we gonna use it in this year? No. We had a great opportunity to increase the income tax and use it properly instead of using it next year for people who, what, up to $150,000 of income? poor choice of how we're going to use a tax increase. Secondly, the corp tax, at least in my scenarios, I never said increase the corp tax, mostly because we have increased it significantly in the last year or two. Having said that, I want to point out that all corporations in this country, including New Jersey, benefited significantly from the federal tax code changes, not only the regular corporations, but also the S corporations. So it also troubles me a little bit that the corporations are complaining that they have to pay a little bit more money. They got a significant tax break. Having said that, I appreciate the problems of making sure we keep the companies here in the state, et cetera, et cetera. And going back to, again, to my first comment, and I'll stop there, sales tax is a, is a good one. It is really non-regressive in New Jersey. We don't tax food. We don't tax clothing. And if we raised it a little bit, we could also give a tax credit to those individuals with certain low incomes. So in my mind, there are some clear increases in taxes that are worthwhile, but, but the use of them is what really is troubling to me. I'll Thanks. stop there. Thanks. Um, Amanda? 
May I? Yes. Just, sure. just real, real quick, because some of the things that, because I think um, John Reitmeyer made a very good point about the growth. You, the growth, because if you take a look at where New Jersey is versus what the rest of the country or our neighbors have done, New Jersey ranks in the bottom, way in the bottom, like uh, next to like, I think like 47th in the, the rate or the growth of, of millionaires. And the one thing that obviously uh, we didn't take into consideration is the impact of inflation on, you know, on, on those numbers. But even when the governor issued their press release about the, increase, the millionaires tax, you got to take, you got to be, you know, take a little bit of pause when you look and say, okay, there's 2,700 more non-resident millionaire filers than there are millionaire, than resident filers. And, you know, believe me, in, so New Jersey, you have both non-resident returns and, and resident returns. So you guys looked and say, why, why is that happening? So I, I just want to put that because there, there is data, you know, you take, take a look on, on, you know, on both sides of the issue. You, you, you don't go and get into a situation where you have $260 billion worth of unfunded liabilities and debt and, you know, without having had made significant, um, you know, bad decisions over a long, long period of time. And as I said, I, I, I believe, obviously, Brandon and I will disagree on how you get those additional resources. Uh, do we need those additional resources? Yes, we do. Um, but at the same time, I think we would be much better off attracting the capital to generate that income. And New Jersey, because of the situation of where we are and, and our assets that we do have, we do have that ability. We really do. We, as long as we stop chasing everybody away. So that sort of teased me up for my last question, which is looking forward, coming out of this budget. Um, Looking forward over the next couple of years, what what is the state of New Jersey's budget? Are we facing a fiscal cliff this year or in fiscal year 2023 when the borrowed money runs out and we have to make up for lost federal aid and we have to pay debt service, um, we have to continue ramping up to our full pension payment, uh, not to mention covering the cost of the new child rebate program and presumably getting back to properly funding the school aid formula. So what are our options then? And John, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're definitely facing a fiscal cliff. I mean, it's just a matter of when at this point, um, you know, and for some of the reasons you just mentioned. So first of all, we're deficit spending in the current uh, budget with borrowed money. And so uh, I wrote a story a, a few weeks ago that highlighted we're over 10%, somewhere between 10 and 15% of annual spending that will be sustained by one shot revenue sources. So we only get this money one year. Um, so we're gonna have to account for that. Uh, and, and I guess we'll have to see as the budget year goes on, how revenue collections influence that. We got a new revenue report out, you know, uh, just a little bit before we started today that showed, uh, you know, the, if, if we were in a traditional fiscal year, they extended it, but we're, uh, if we, just consider July, September, uh, July, August, and September, we'd still be almost 9% behind where we were last year. And as Brandon mentioned, we don't know where we're headed. I mean, the, the second wave, uh, we're obviously seeing continued uh, infections in New Jersey. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't know how deep it's going to get. Treasury predicts we won't see growth until next spring, starting next spring, but, but that's not even a given. And so, you know, there are big things that uh, as we lose borrowed money or, you know, there is an there is a, uh, indication that there is likely another stimulus package coming from the federal government. I think a lot of people are looking towards the outcome of the presidential election as a way to sort of handicap that. If you see Joe Biden win and you see the uh, Senate flip Democratic, you might see a more robust I think there's an expectation that you'd see a more robust uh, federal recovery effort, which could mean you know, we'd have money in New Jersey to pay down that borrowing. But that just means we still have the one shot unless the federal government is providing us money year after year. And, and I don't think that will be the case. And so, yes, the school funding formula, we're supposed to be increasing on a regular basis under a law that was passed just a few years ago. The pension contribution, we've been following a one-tenth ramp, uh, ramp up that we're still in the midst of. 
uh, and we actually fell a little slightly short in this new budget that was just uh, signed into law. And so that's another big cost that's looming as we have to confront this idea of losing uh, federal dollars or borrowed money. Um, and as you mentioned, now we have this promise to use some of the revenue that will be collected by hiking taxes to pay people uh, some sort of a tax rebate, some people next year uh, on, the eve of a, on the eve of a big election. And so those are all kind of pressure points uh, that I think New Jersey is going to have to come to terms with. It's kind of easy for me as a journalist to just highlight these problems and not have to come up with the solutions. Um, you know, I, I recognize that the people who make the decisions, the senator and, you know, governor and those, those uh, in the legislature have tough, very tough decisions to make uh, in what could be really a still evolving uh, situation, both you know, from a public health perspective, which is really our number one concern. And then for all of us who look at the numbers right behind that from how it affects the economy and how it affects the revenue stream. Thanks, John. So to turn to the Senator, do you agree that those are the challenges and do you have any thoughts on how to tackle them? Oh, yeah, well, thanks, Amanda. And, and, and John's always extremely, extremely thoughtful. I love reading his pieces. I, I said many times on many panels, I said, the, John would make an excellent budget um, member of the budget committee. He understands it extremely well. But as far as facing a fiscal cliff, New Jersey has been facing this fiscal cliff for, for many, 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 many years. And unfortunately hasn't, you know, really had the, you know, courage to, you know, restructure uh, some of the things. So, you know, Senator Sweeney had asked, actually I think, in, and Professor Keevy was on that, the path to progress. And we put out a report and not everybody agreed with everything that was in the report. And I give the Senator, Senate President Sweeney a lot of credit in the fact that he went around the state and I was with him. And I know Richard was with him at, at, different, at different locations um, about you know, what New Jersey is facing. And I said before, New Jersey, and this is many, many administrations, you know, is, has always been good at making promises, but making payments, they're not. And I'll, just for example, it really scares me about this four and a half billion dollars worth of debt. The, the legislation allows them, we talked about 12 years, the legislation that was passed that I voted against uh, allows them to, to uh, refinance it over a much, much longer period of time. Um, and as, as an example, in 1997 under the Whitman administration, they did those pension bonds and it was issued. And quite frankly, then there was about, there's, um, over, over the years, about $2.9 billion uh, that were issued, most of which was issued in 1997. Well, guess how much is still outstanding today? $2 billion. $2 billion. So how do we think it's going to be for this $4.5 billion? $4 billion? So I, I'm, I'm just going to say, I certainly hope, and I've had many discussions with the Senate President, also certainly with, with the Speaker, and I'll, I'll keep on trying to say that you know, we have to get back. We did that path to progress. Um, so many, so many reports and uh, have, have gathered dust over, over the years through many administrations. And quite frankly, I was hopeful that this wouldn't, but so far it has. And there's, there's no magic, there's no silver bullet there. There's no real, you know, um, unique idea that we had come up with. If you look at all the different studies that were done over the years, this, you know, we, we had a little bit of a different take on some of them, but if we don't take some of these actions, you know, the fiscal cliff, forget it, we'll, we'll always be at the fiscal cliff, and it's going to take a long time for New Jersey to get out of it, and the only way they're going to do it is by having some, you know, some fiscal discipline, and unfortunately, we, we haven't, you know, for, for, for decades, so, um, so yes, I do think we are at the fiscal cliff. I think we've been there for a long time and we got to get some courage to actually um, you know, get it addressed. Thanks, Senator. So Brandon, do you agree on the fiscal cliff and what are your thoughts on solutions going forward? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, and really great to be with you and John and um, the Senator and the professor. We need to have more conversations like these more regularly. Um, Senator and I definitely agree. We, we've been facing fiscal cliffs for a long time and will continue to. 
and um, agree that, you know, New Jersey is really great about talking what it wants to spend money on, but not raising the ability to actually pay for those things. And that's a major, major problem. Uh, NJPP did a report a couple years ago with Cliff Goldman um, called the Notorious Nine, talking about the fact that it's been three decades of consistency of not being honest about what it's going to take to get uh, our fiscal house in order and making bad decision after bad decision. And so I don't think you, fisk, you fix three decades of bad decision making over a winter. Uh, you know, you probably don't fix it over the course of one administration. Um, but, you know, a lot of this gets down to the budget process that we have in place. And I think the budget process that we have is woefully inadequate. Um, it, it is one that awards drama, it awards secrecy, it awards backroom deal making. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, um, cooperation and partnership between the OLS and the Treasury as much as there could be. And a lot of the decisions that get made are, you know, basically how can we get through the next 12 months where the decision should be focused on where does the state need to be to address the challenges that we know we're going to have in 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, we need to have a longer timeline and a longer sort of view of the horizon when we're making decisions today about our budget. And so the process doesn't really make a lot of space for those considerations. And I think it does us a, a very serious disservice uh, all, all the way around. And so there should be more conversations about how we budget in New Jersey and how we come to these decisions. Um, because it's, it's, you know, there are, there are best practices that other states have been implementing. Uh, things like multi-year budgeting, multi-year proje projections, uh, combined, combined uh, projections from, you know, the, the legislature and, and the treasury. Uh, those, I think, would help improve the process quite a bit. Um, and, and there are things that we should, we should pursue vigorously. Um, but yeah, we, we are going to be facing fiscal crises, you know, with regards to the question of do we have enough money <laughs> uh, for, for the foreseeable future here, and especially because the crisis that we're currently in, which is really a twin crisis, right? It is, it is a it's a economic crisis, which we have seen before. But it's also a health crisis that we haven't seen in a century that we don't really know when it's going to end or how it's going to end or if it's going to end, right, and fully. And that just, when you have that level of uncertainty, uh, it, it can be really tough to make, uh, to make decisions uh, that, that, you're, that you're confident about. Um, but I just think going forward, we need to do better. We need to have... Uh, more robust conversations, more public, robust debate around our budget process, uh, have it be less secretive, um, and, and talk about, you know, I think our budget conversation is a little bit backwards. We talk about what we have the wherewithal and the political will to raise, and then say, well, how, what do we want to spend it on? Uh, and, you know, sort of, you know, the professor highlighted the rebate. Even the rebate, depending on who you talk to, it's a one-time deal or it's an every-year deal, right? We don't really know. If you want to do it permanently, the smart way to do that, you know, the, the, the smartest way to do that would be, you know, making a change in the tax code through the EITC or the child tax credit or something like that. You just did a rebate. So at least the millionaire's tax is permanent, uh, but the rebate, we don't, we don't even know what that is. And so we, we raise certain revenue and then we say what we want to spend it on. The conversation needs to be, what are the needs of the state? What do we want our transportation system to look like? What do we want our education system to look like, right? What do we want housing development to look like? How much is that going to cost? And then how are we going to raise that revenue? But that's not the conversation we have. We have how much can we, how much are we willing to raise first and how are, we, how are we willing to get it? And then we talk about what to spend. And I think that's a backwards conversation. Thanks, Brandon. That's a really interesting perspective. Um, so Professor, I'll give you the last word on this question. We have had fiscal cliffs, but nothing like this. So this is much more dramatic. Of, of course, uh, exacerbated by the virus. And our solution is to create another fiscal cliff by, rate, by selling bonds to fill in a gap that wasn't needed in the first place. So when we look out for the next two or three years, I could be looking at numbers, depends upon how I compute them, of six and seven billion dollars between what current revenue we collect and what possible expenditures we need to make. We need to, for example, address the pension system. Uh, the Path to Progress report identified a way to do it that would affect no retirees and no people who are currently a, a state employee or a local employee, but for new people. And it has been basically totally ignored by, by everybody other than the group that put it together. Did you know that 73% of all spending in this state is at the local level? It's not by the state government. Because all the income tax money goes back to the locals. 
So again, the local governments need to step up a little bit and the state needs to take some leadership to address the number of school districts that we have, regionalize them where obviously important and necessary. Also a lot of school districts, I was on a school board for nine years and we proposed a couple times for our local districts to get together. And you know what the answers were? Yeah, but we've had this football team for years. We don't want to change the way in which we do business. So sometimes the arguments don't make any sense. So the cliff is big, it's exacerbated by the borrowing, it's exacerbated by the fires, it's exacerbated by the pension system. We have school aid underfunding and we have capital needs for the school districts. Add them all together and we're looking at big problems. I would not like to be the governor in the next year or two or the budget director for that matter. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, thank you so much. Um, now I'm going to turn to some questions from the audience. So the first question comes from the former state treasurer, David Russo. He says, leaders have said that if more federal money comes in, paying down the debt would be a priority. And do all of you agree that that's likely to happen? Or will the state keep the full borrowing amount and spend the federal money to support more spending in fiscal year 22? Um, so does anyone want to jump in on that? Brandon? I mean, I would just uh, hey, you know, Senator, you go first. <laughs> so that's right, Brandon. You go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, mean, I get yeah, a lot of time to talk. I think, um, yeah, I think if, if there's federal support um, that comes in more significantly, and like I said before, a lot of this is determined by the lack of having a reliable partner in the federal government this time around, which is really difficult. Um, but if, if there is going to be more federal support, uh, I think the state should prioritize paying down the borrowing that we just that we just instituted us uh, because you know, really improving our credit rating, which took, you know, we had 11 downgrades over the past decade. Uh, improving the credit rating is gonna be critical uh, to getting a lot of these things fixed. And so, um, you know, everything's a balance, but I think prioritizing paying down uh, the new borrowing would be, would be important. Senator, did you wanna? Oh yeah, uh, Amanda, I, I, I hope we never have to borrow the money in the first place. And if, you know, if, if, if something doesn't have to be borrowed, then we don't have to pay it back, um, particularly on a, over some sort of long-term basis. But yes, I do hope that if there happens to be additional, uh, you, know, you know, some, uh, you know, additional federal relief coming, that, that we use it to pay down the debt. The other thing which I would suggest is we already have CARES Act money that's sitting there that we could utilize to help our businesses uh, get going. I, I do. I did see. Uh, I took a quick look at the revenue for revenue numbers that had come in that John had mentioned before, and interestingly enough, the sales tax numbers were actually higher than than last uh, last September. But if and if we were able to get our businesses um, up and running safely quicker, obviously we'd have more resources. You know, coming. You know, coming in. So I, as I said, I you know if if there's any uh, extra. Federal relief. Yes, I, I certainly hope we never have to borrow the money in, in, in the first place. I don't think we should have, you know, obviously with all the discussions we've had, you know, but also there is money that's sitting there right now that can help, you know, uh, bring in additional resources to help mitigate any kind of borrowing that, that the governor wants to do. I would say my fear would be if we get federal money, and it's probably not going to happen until at best after the election. But if we get federal money, we'll use that and sell bonds. So we'll have a double whammy to address this fiscal cliff. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Let's say as, as the questionnaire asked, they suggested maybe we could pay off the debt if we ever issued the debt. The cynic in me says, we're gonna do both. We're gonna sell the bonds, and then we're gonna get the federal money and we're not gonna pay the bonds back. We'll use it to address other needs in the state. And the fiscal cliff might not be in 23, but it'll be in 24, but it's going to be a wise person to use the money properly if we get it. Yeah, I, I would just add, certainly everyone, and even as this borrowing uh, went through uh, the legislature, everyone was talking about using it to, if we did get federal money, uh, and I think Professor Keevy's right. I think it'll be months before we would get it, uh, that it would be used to, to pay down this debt. There, there would be no uh, prepayment penalty. So unlike the pension bonds that Senator Orho was discussing, I mean, 
we, we are, we're kind of stuck with, with, with those, with that debt and the interest on it. Um, in this case, we could pay it off early if the will was there. You know, it's a good question uh, that Dave asks because, you know, I, I guess I've been around Trenton a little while and I know the temptation will definitely be there to uh, say, even if we get federal dollars, there might be this other compelling need. And I mentioned next year is an election year, not just for the governor, but for the legislature itself. And so it's, it's a really good question and something we have to, to keep, keep uh, an eye on. But I will say everyone up until those final votes had been saying, yeah, if we get uh, significant federal aid and it, and it looks like we could, that the, the idea would be to use uh, that money to, to pay down some of this borrowing. Um, I guess we'll just have to see if those are promises or if, if that ends up being the case. Amanda, John, you make a very good point about the prepayment penalty. I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that would apply only if they use the municipal liquidity facility uh, that the federal government and the Federal Reserve has allowed. But I think once they go to the private market, um, and I know the, uh, the uh, municipal liquidity facility is, is for a three year period, but once you go to extend it past the three years, uh, obviously you're, you're on, on open market you know, conditions. Um, do you still think that there wouldn't be any sort of prepayment penalty if, you know, if, if we had to go further than the uh, MLF? I guess it all be depend on how it gets structured. I mean, they've talked about, uh, you know, uh, even funded uh, 10 or 12 year borrowing if, you know, outside of the MLF, uh, I, you know, I've also seen a lot of uh, more responsible borrowing proposals get refinanced maybe by the next governor into something that, that just pushes those interest costs out further. So, yeah. um, you know, it's another one of these stay tuned. Yeah, no, very, very good. Because quite frankly, if, if, if there's a prepayment, if there is a prepayment penalty, you normally get a lower cost up front. If there's no prepayment penalty, you pay a higher interest rate up front. Richard probably knows that a heck of a lot better than me. So thanks, guys. Um, so getting back to the path to progress and to reform, uh, we have a question from an anonymous viewer. Right after the governor announced that there was a deal in place for a budget and borrowing, Senator Sweeney made some statements via Twitter that sounded like there was an understanding to move forward on elements of the path to progress. And the question asked, was I imagining that? Pension reform would be great, but very hard to do. Same with school consolidation. Any chance for either of these in the next 12 months? I, I'll take that to start with. If it would not, as I said before, uh, Senator Sweeney, after the report went out, he, he, he went around the state looking and telling people about it. And I, I was at a number of ruckus, um, you know, of demonst you know the, the demonstrations or the, or the presentations, and he didn't back down. And I, I firmly believe, and, and, you know, obviously Richard was there in these meetings, and how uh, committed uh, Senate President Swinney is thinking that this cost reforms have to be, you know, have to be made. So I was, I was uh, hopeful you know, I've been hopeful since the report went out, and obviously I haven't been, uh, you know, it hasn't come to fruition, but I certainly hope that we would do it. And it's, I, I've seen the Senate president at, at these meetings, so I know he's not afraid to talk about it. But also the reality is, as, as uh, uh, the professor had talked about, is the new plan. Even if we went with new employees, the idea is that, you know, no current retiree or or, or uh, active individual would, would, would lose anything. And, and quite frankly, it would modernize our pension system to you know, have, it's called a hybrid plan, but, but younger employees would have a portability because how many people actually stay in their same career any, anymore for, you know, for, for 20 years? The odds are they're probably, gonna, they're, they're probably going to you know, go to another career, but unfortunately, the way some of these defined benefit plans work um, even if you don't like your job and you stay there for 10 years, you're almost like handcuffed to say, well, I'm going to stay another 10 years because, you know, I've, I've got this defined benefit that I'm, that I'm going to give up. Um, the U S the U S military went to a, a, you know, a hybrid type, you know, type of plan 
for, for new recruits. And it really does give some benefit, you know, some flexibility and portability to, uh, you know, to, you know, to those employees. And we'd also obviously make it available to anybody else who voluntarily wanted, you know, wanted to, you know, to come in. But a lot of these companies, a lot of the companies have done these kind of what they call cash balance plans. And uh, I think particularly our younger employees is something that they would like. Now, if I, my, myself, if I'm looking at something that's 35% funded, and I'm starting, you know, a new career in, in, in state government, I'm kind of concerned whether I'm actually, you know, if, if I'm waiting for 25, 30 years, whether I'm going to end up getting, you know, getting those payments. I think what we came up with would make sure that, that, that they did, but also give them some flexibility. So I'm hopeful. Thanks, uh, Senator. And, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll kick in. Call, call me a cynic. It's been about two and a half years since we issued the report. No action has been done. Uh, just to remind everybody, part of the pension problem is because the state funds all of the local school districts. The employees, the teachers who work for the school districts, the school district pays none of that, nor do they pay any of the retirement health benefits for teachers, nor do they pay any of the social security contributions. So all that is on the state budget, which is a big piece of the, of the spending. And the recommendations would address some of that. The recommendations will also address areas of school consolidations and municipal consolidations. And going back to my point that 73% of all spending is at the local level, unless we do something there, and including the pension systems big time, we won't meet the problem of the, of the, of the, of the coming disaster, in my opinion. And uh, count me as a cynic today, a hopeful yes. cynic. Just quickly, the only, the only thing I would insist upon, though, when, when we're thinking about anything with regards to pension reform is a racial impact statement. Um, it, it should be no surprise, and everybody knows that, you know, public jobs have been a significant pathway to the middle class for Black Americans for a very, very long time. Um, a significant share of public workers are women. And when you look at some of the proposals that were put forth, it seems like there may be more aggressive reforms proposed for professions that are more likely to be workers of color and, and women than for those who are not. And it would be, that would be a tragedy to see because I think we're, we have historically as a nation been a little too comfortable and eager with reforms that are you know, on the backs of already marginalized communities. So I, I appreciate the tremendous work that has been done on the path to progress, but it, re, it needs a racial impact statement. We need to be very, very clear about who we are asking to consider these changes and these reforms and what that means for the situations they are already in. And with regards to younger workers, well, you know, you have a younger workforce that is coming into, uh, you know, its professional life with more debt than it's ever had than any other, any other generation. Uh, the, the, the student loan debt average went up 10% this year alone, went from 32,000 last year to 35,000 this year on average. And so if you're talking about reducing benefits, for folks who are already in significant debt, that's going to be a challenge for them, right? And I think we need to recognize that, you know, that might have an effect on reducing people's interest in public work. And that would just be another negative impact on the public sector, which needs more people. It needs more experts. It needs more people who really dig wonky, unsexy work, but that is critical to operating and maintaining and improving our society. And so I, I, I understand that there are a lot of pension challenges ahead for the state of New Jersey, but let's not, let's not be coy and you know, sort of ignore the fact that the reason those challenges exist is because the state did not hold up its end of the bargain. It's the state that put us in this situation. And so to make a change that is going to then, uh, you know, sort of harm and, and penalize workers, you know, by and large, uh, I think is not a fair, uh, you know, a, a fair response. I think there needs to be more balanced response and whatever happens should be done at the negotiating table. Thanks, just just, to, and yeah. just a, a comment on that, if I could. The one thing they, uh, to, to remember on these, these um, defined contribution plans, New Jersey, or New Jersey got into this problem because they weren't putting in contributions of many, many administrations, right? The thing about a defined contribution plan, you have to make your payments. So the idea of the idea of no more promises and no payments, right? So you have to make your payments. The other thing is, is you take a look at um, there's you know 
I, I think when somebody looks in and has been there for five years and they've you've got five years invested in their career and then they leave to go to another job and they have nothing to take with them for their retirement. That hurts. So now if you have a new, um, you know, modernized kind of, kind of plan that they, they take it and they take it with them and they see, a, you know, a 403B, a 457, you know, a 401k type of plan that, that is, is increasing. All of a sudden, you know, and hopefully they have enough discipline to say, okay, you know, that's for your retirement, right? Um, I think there's a lot more financial security in that, um, you know, quite frankly, for, for everyone. Um, and that's what I would just say, because I think the issue is, you, you know, in, in a defined contribution plan, you've got to make those payments where in a defined, co- de- defined benefit plan, they didn't have to, you know. If, you know, if, we, were pri- if we were private, in the private industry, in the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation was, you know, uh, was, you know the, had oversight, it would have never happened. But unfortunately, they don't have oversight over, over government plans. Yeah. Uh, did you have a response? Yeah, and I would just note um, the questioner made an astute observation right after sort of the budget, the tax hikes, and the borrowing all got approved. You did see Sweeney and the budget committee chairman in the Senate, uh, Paul Sarlo, uh, pivot to the talking about uh, some of the spending reforms that were part of the, the Path to Progress report from a few years back. And I think those are more than just talking points for those for those guys. I, I do think that, you know, um, there was a sense of cooperation in Trenton as we got down to the budget deadline in late September, and that uh, everybody sort of had a give and take there. The, the challenge is I, I don't think you really heard that kind of talk in the assembly. And next year, the assembly is on the on the ballot. And so it's, it would be a a tough lift to be pushing public worker benefit changes with the caveat being, you know, the governor has said all along and the governor maintains good relations with the unions that once we sort of lived up to our promises as a state, I mean, as Brandon mentioned, you know, state hasn't made full payments in quite a while and some years, no payments at all toward the pension system. You know, we're still not making full payments, even as this ramp up plan is in effect. And so the hole keeps getting deeper to some degree. Uh, the, the question would be, as there, you know, this is a really big pension contribution that, that's in the, this budget in mid, amid a pandemic, a, a recession caused by a big pandemic. Do we eventually see uh, the unions come to the table and maybe somebody like Governor Murphy has the political capital now to broker some sort of uh, meaningful path forward that maybe everybody might not like but could live with? I think that's a big question and, and maybe that's something for, you know, after the election. But uh, in, in terms of just in the near term, uh, until we hear more of that talk out of the assembly, I don't know how seriously we can take it. Uh, Amanda, just real so, quick, because John, John brings up a real good point. And in the Senate, and, and just back to the professor's uh, comment, once that report came out, it was uh, Senate President Sweeney and Senator Saul and myself, there were actually bills introduced in the Senate on a bipartisan basis for uh, maybe not all the recommendations, but I think a, 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 you know, a very significant percentage of them. I don't believe that, that there were many that were ever introduced in the assembly. So I, I, I do think that um, on a bipartisan basis, they were introduced. Uh, in the Senate, and hopefully the the assembly um, and you know maybe the you know the speaker, the Senate president, and the governor can can come to an agreement as to let's get some of these bills moving. Um, so a, a related question that came in from another anonymous uh, viewer is how important is it to keep to the schedule to get to the full actuarially required contribution to the pension system by fiscal year 2023, and what's the cost if we don't? I, and I'll, t- I'll, I'll, I'll take that to start with because I was actually the sponsor of the bill to make sure we used to be that used to, the pension payment used to be the last payment ever made in, in, at, at the end of the fiscal year. So what, what, what would end up happening is we didn't have the money, so they didn't make the payment. Uh, we actually put in place 
where um, you know it, the pension payment would be made on a uh, you know 25 percent uh, you know each uh, each year uh, that that we would make those we make those payments. Um, I'm not really sure if the, if the administration followed it this year, uh, or they or they didn't, or got it suspended because of the, the pandemic. But that that had been done for for actually a number of years, and it's and quite frankly, it, it saved the state uh, you know a, a significant amount of money because because at the time the plans you know plans were doing very well. And, and one of the key things about any kind of financial planning is you know you keep putting in in the money. To, you know, um, because dollar cost averaging generally helps uh, your, your total return. But anyway, um, it is important that, hey, listen, those were promises that were made. We're not going to get out of them, but let's, let's face it at the same time that, you know, um, as I keep saying, the promises are easy, payments are hard, but um, we came up with a plan that would have made sure we, we kept our commitments and also modernized, modernized the plan for for you know, younger younger employees as or newer new new employees not younger but just just newer employees. Brandon, yeah, I think making the payments is extremely important. That's how we got in the situation to begin with, right? By not making payments, and so there's always going to be you know we have a national economy that has boom and bust cycles, uh, and if we're going to during every bust cycle defer pension payments, then we're never going to get out of this out of this hole. And so I think making the payments is, is critical and, and staying on track to that full payment in 2023 is, is, is 100% necessary. And by the time we get there, then we really have a full picture of what our, what our requirement is and what the options are that we should, we should choose from to, to really get a hold of this. Uh, but the last thing I would want to see is, is deferring or reducing the actuarial, you know, the, 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 the ramp up plan to get to a full payment now. Thanks, Brandon. Professor? I'll just make a couple observations. Uh, one, we got into the problem starting out when the, when the governor decided, Governor Whitman decided not to put the proper amount in the pension system and sell bonds. Therefore, we created a budget shortfall that year that was solved only by bonds. And nobody addressed it for the next subsequent year. Governors could have put money in but they, the governor and the legislature chose to spend it on something else. It wasn't that we didn't have the money, we didn't spend it where the obligation was. The only way to get out of this problem, unfortunately, is to redesign the system. We, we, we're never gonna be able to make payments consistently to fund the pension over a long period of time. Another point, remember the pension system isn't gonna run out tomorrow or the next day or five years from now, it's the out years. And that's why a change in the system would be exceptionally a good move to do. Just real quick, and, and the professor reminded me of one thing that when, when a lot of these changes were made, and everybody looks at the state as well, but the, it, and you got to read the actual reports, which is to put everybody to sleep. But when you look at the actual reports, the changes that were made in the actual assumptions or in how assets got valued and whatnot, those are all those are all decisions that quite frankly even the unions agreed with, which quite frankly put us in a much worse situation. And then they borrowed the money, which made it even and which made it even more, you know, significantly worse. And we still owe two billion dollars on that debt. So it was not a good decision. I, I would just add I would add two things. Um, it you know the pension system, when we talk about it, it is made up of different funds representing different worker groups. And some of those funds are better funded than others. Some of them have a, what's known as a depletion date that's coming up a little sooner than some of the others. And so um, there, there is a little bit of nuance to that, but I will say just knowing uh, from interactions with the rating agencies, we may like it or not, but uh, they are looking very closely at whether we stick on this ramp up schedule I think they would have liked to have seen us get to full funding quite a while ago. Uh, and so uh, I know that's been one of the issues uh, that's being looked at very closely is can New Jersey stick to this ramp up schedule? You know, we're one of the worst funded or the worst funded pension systems in the nation for a reason. And it's a concern. And I would just come back to that credit rating. 
uh, you know, lawmakers don't like to increase taxes, uh, especially broad-based taxes. But when the credit rating gets knocked and we have to pay more when we have to borrow for capital expenditures, it puts more debt service into the annual budget, which just has to be funded with either tax increases or crowding out other spending. And so it's not always a direct impact as, you know, somebody gets that, like that gas tax bill that just went up that we all, we all face. But indirectly, uh, when the rating agencies, you know, come down on us, it does impact the bottom line at some point and in some way. Thanks, John. So I'm going to go to one last question. It'll also be a chance for you to give your final wrapping up remarks. So this is from Mark Pfeiffer. Uh, he says, following up on Brandon and Rich's comments, is it fair to say that New Jersey's people expect more from their government than they are willing to pay? So does anyone want to go first on that one? I, I, can, I can start. Uh, John Shore, who founded NJPP, told me a great story once, which was he was in South Carolina visiting with, I think, elected officials down there. And he had remarked to them saying, oh, you have a lot of New Jerseyans moving down here. And the person said to him, yeah, you can have them back because they expect their trash to be picked up twice a week. Right. And yes, that's exactly what happens when you have an expectation for services uh, that requires paying for those services. Um, I think that we do have an uh, issue with regards to a tax code that does that is not progressively structured and then it's therefore, you know, I think I think we have centered the interests of the wealthy far more than we need to uh, when it comes to balancing our budget and, and the, the end result is having, uh, you know, increased poverty and increased suffering for already marginalized communities. And I think, you know, the number one metric we should all be looking at as to whether or not the state is successful is the poverty rate. You know, keeping the poverty rate low, putting, making the poverty rate low will lead to economic growth and success. But as long as people live in poverty, and especially people who've been not just left behind, but pushed behind forever, uh, you know, the state's ability to grow is going to be, is going to be sort of handcuffed. Uh, so, yeah, you know, we have a state that has this sort of, you know, dominant ethos of taxes are too high. And yes, property taxes do rank up there nationally. When you look at all the other taxes that we have, especially as a share of people's income, not really. Um, we have wealthy residents here. And if we have wealthy residents, then wealthy residents should be paying high, higher taxes. That's, that's how it should go. And we have high expectations for a reliable transportation system that has not lived up to what we want it to be. We have expectations for high quality K, you know, pre-K through 12 and higher education um, you know, institutions that are not as affordable as they should be. We have high expectations for being able to live in an interesting and vibrant community that is safe. Uh, and there's too many parts of the state where that is not true. Uh, none, of the, none of that gets better by cutting taxes. And you know, even with the path to progress, even though there's a lot of great work done there, I, I've, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the stipulation was made to figure out how to fix the pension system without increasing taxes. I don't think that's a fair stipulation. If everything's on the table, then put everything on the table. And the fact of the matter is that the very, very wealthy in the state, you know, when it comes to a share of their income, pay a lower share of their income to taxes than, than the middle class does. And so uh, we should fix that. Uh, and that will help us. It's not, it's not going to be everything. It's not a silver bullet, but it will improve our situation and help us along the way towards our goals. And so, yeah, New Jerseyans do have high expectations. That should not be a surprise to anyone. Thanks, oh, man, it's not going to be a surprise. It's great to be on, on the panel here with Brandon, but obviously he and I will disagree on how we bring in additional resources, you know, in, into the state. Um, with respect to... Um, with, you know, with respect to the people, you know, not want to really pay for government. I mean, mo most time if, if, you know, people don't want to, they really don't want to pay for anything and they'd like to keep things in their pocket. And quite frankly, that also includes taxes. Um, but at, at the same time, I don't think um, government has been very good at explaining what, what the value is that that, that, is, that is received. You know, and even as the professor had mentioned about the number of municipalities and the schools and some of this, there is so much more efficiency that we can do in New Jersey, you know, you know quite frankly, and, and unfortunately there hasn't been the, the political courage, you know, to do it. Um, and also to be able to tell, go out there and you look at the quote unquote, you know, New Jersey loves home rule, 
Um, but at the same time, I think it, was, it may have been, and Richard, you may have been involved with this, but I think under Governor uh, Tom uh, uh, Kane, they mentioned that uh, the cost of home rule was probably some in the range of, you know, 25 to, I think I heard as high as like 40 percent as, as, as the cost. So, you know, people, people want to have that kind of, you know, uh, that, that, that kind of government. But it is, let's face it, it's, it's, it's become extremely, extremely expensive. It's more than 20, it's, it's uh, let's see, it's more than 20 percent of our, of our gross domestic, our gross domestic product in New Jersey. That overhead rate is extremely, you know, way, way, way too, you know, too high. So, um, and I, I, will, I will also say that the expectations of government in New Jersey are very low because of the decisions that have been made and those, they, and they see the situation that we're in, they see that we have, you know, at the state level, $260 billion worth of, you know, you know, promises that were made that we have to pay back later on. And unfortunately, you know, nobody really wants to be in a situation where they know they're going to be in a hole for a long time. They want to be able to see that's, you know, something, some sort of daylight of getting out and getting into a better f uh, fiscal situation. So I really, in the, in the end, the answer is, I, I really think that, you know, the state has to, has to show and, and, and all government levels have to show that we can be a heck of a lot more efficient. Um, and then also talk about, listen, here's, here, here are the values that we have in New Jersey. Because, I mean, we do have them. But the government, we, our overhead rate for government, way too high. Just an observation. Thanks, from Senator. Mark. Professor, I think you were going to say something. Yeah. Um, I think Mark Pfeiffer raises a good question. And he may talk to the same kind of people that I talk to. And they say, I don't get anything from the government. And why should I be paying all this money? Because they're in relatively good condition financially. But we have to make a distinction, I think, in life and in government between the self and the community. Uh, I don't need a lot of support from, from government, thank God, but I know a lot of people do need support. And that's why I don't have any problem paying for the Medicaid program. I don't have any problem paying for school aid for districts who need assistance. It's the right thing to do as far as community involvement versus self. By the same token, it's not an open-ended trough. There has to be some constraints. You just can't just say, oh, we need more money and just raise it. And so I'm sort of in between my point of view and Brandon's point of view. I'm certainly not on to Brandon's uh, extensive funding of activities, but I certainly want to make the distinction between self and community. And we need, need to move away from self to the community one. Uh, one final comment to pick up on my comment versus Brandon's comment. He made earlier a comment that we're, we're, our budget is smaller than what it was 10 years ago. And I think he used some phrase like, well, inflation adjusted. And I get that point. But the person that Mark's talking about looks at the spending and says, we spent $28 billion 10 years ago. We're now spending $41 billion. That's a big increase, no matter how you look at it. And therefore, the person who says, I'm not getting my money but worth what I spent, you got to understand their self. And I'm not trying to downplay the self, but I want to make sure people understand. And sometimes you got to invest some money in the community as a whole. It's just the question of what is the level of the community. Thanks so, so much. I don't, I don't want to get into a, you know, a, a, a philosophical, moral debate about it, but I thought I would throw those thoughts down. Thanks. And then John with the last word. Yeah, and uh, thank you for, for having me be part of this discussion, both with uh, the panel and with uh, those watching and asking questions. Mark hits on, not surprisingly, you know, a really good uh, point. You know, there, it's really easy for people to make uh, promises. We'll pay for this, we'll fund this. We have laws on the books that call for all kinds of uh, spending, it's, it's harder to make the decisions, the hard decisions to, to pay for that, whether it's cutting somewhere or raising a tax on someone. And I go back to that old adage of where you stand depends on where you sit. And I think that's kind of what Professor Keevy was getting at. Uh, I'm certainly not going to take any, uh, offer any opinions on specific tax policies, but, you know, this, this state 
has a lot of income inequality. This nation has a lot of income inequality. And I think it's not a one size fits all uh, in terms of uh, how we approach things, both on where we spend our dollars and where we raise them. And I, I remember sitting through uh, uh, Federal Reserve, something that the New York, uh, the Federal Reserve out of New York did that looked deeply at the issue of income inequality. And I think in the, in the back of our minds in New Jersey, that's something that we should be mindful of. You know, are we providing value for the dollar and are we spending our dollars uh, where they should be spent to get the, the best return for both uh, individuals and the community? And again, it's easy for me as a journalist to not have to make those hard decisions and, and then have people judge me on them. But I do think those are the types of questions we should be asking when we talk about things like um, taxes and spending and the, the, the expectations that people have and you know whose expectations are we listening to and where are we uh, putting the uh, biggest amount of our resources and for why. So, so I, again, thank you and, and thanks to uh, everyone who's been, been watching. Thank you, yes, and thanks, thanks to all the panelists and thanks to everyone who joined us on Zoom and Facebook. Um, so at the Corporation for New Jersey Local Media, we're gonna be hosting many more webinars like this one and doing what we can to strengthen community journalism throughout New Jersey. We work to preserve and expand the quality and accessibility of professional journalism that's vital to community, civic engagement, and the practice of democracy. So you can support professional journalism by subscribing to NewJerseyHills.com and also by supporting or contributing to other important news publications like New Jersey Spotlight at njspotlight.com. And we hope you'll join us at newsweneed.org to learn more. We're actually in the midst of our first fundraiser to support this community engagement series, so you can learn more and donate on our website, which is newsweneed.org. So thanks again to everyone, and thanks to all our attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, all.